So we're going to talk about the environment. We're going to talk about robots. We're going to talk about lionfish. And we're also going to talk about a phrase, why don't you just? This has been a very, very important phrase in my life, uh, in my career. And frankly, it, it plays an important part in the story of, of the lionfish and the robots. Um, and we'll spend the first, say, eight minutes or so talking about that concept of why don't you just, and then I will talk about how that played this important role in my life. So first of all, hello, my name is Erica. Lovely to meet you all. Hopefully after this we might have a chance to meet again, whether it's at our booth down, downstairs in the Tech Showcase. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I love to scuba dive. I love Star Trek. I love clothes and shoes, as you can see. I love classical music, and I love viruses. And when I was a kid, uh, I worked on an independent science fair project where I was studying the herpes virus. So as you can imagine, being in middle school, for those who don't know, the herpes virus causes cold sores and, and other sores. Um, I was nicknamed the virus girl, which made me incredibly popular, as you can imagine, in middle school. And so with someone with this sort of bizarre array of, of interests and talents, it was really unclear um, what I was going to end up doing. Who knows, right? Thankfully, this did not happen. My, my parents were, were very happy about that. But something else happened. So here's a question for the audience. You didn't realize you were coming into an interactive session. How many times in the last week have you either said something or been told something like this? Why don't you just eat healthier? Why don't you just exercise more? Why don't you go and clean your room? Why don't you find meaning in your life? How many times has this happened, say, in the last you know, week or two? I, I, I would assume everyone at some point has made this statement or has somebody say something like this to them, right? So, People will say these things. Now, of those things, how many of those do we actually hear? And then most importantly, how many do we actually act on? And I think part of the premise of this talk is to encourage you not necessarily to act on every single thing that somebody suggests, but to take it seriously. Um, I have found in many aspects of my life that had I not taken that advice and not listened carefully that I would have missed valuable opportunities, both career-wise uh, and also, um, you know, professionally and personally in, in personal development. And so it's very important that, that we listen to this, this advice. And so really this talk is a cautionary tale on the ramifications of listening to other people. So quickly, just a couple of minutes um, talking about this, this statement, why don't you just, a couple of examples in my life, why don't you just enter the Miss America pageant? Why don't you just turn your PhD thesis into a company? These are things uh, that ultimately had happened to me. And then, of course, why don't you just build a robot to get the lionfish? And we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that one. And ultimately, I followed through. So these are things that I did with the help of amazing and wonderful people, my husband, my parents, uh, mentors, you know, friends, uh, teammates. And again, as you go through life and you, you start new things and you experience new things, you can't do it alone. You have to find people, build teams, inspire people, encourage people. Uh, this is just, a, I think, a very important uh, premise uh, in life. And I tell you, it's been an adventure ever since. So very briefly, uh, one moment in my life that was, that was quite critical, take you back to 2001. I was a student at MIT, and a group of us were sitting around watching television one Friday night, and the Miss America pageant was on. And I had my friends actually say to me, hey, you should do this. Uh, you love clothes. You, you can play the piano. You, you know, you have this nonprofit that you're starting to get kids excited about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. You should do this. And I said, no way. Not in a million years. I'm not going to do this. And then they kept talking to me about it. They kept encouraging me. And then I, you know, I finally 
decided, you know what, why not? So they said, why don't you just enter it? And I thought, well, you know, who knows? Maybe it'll be interesting. Uh, maybe I'll get to, to see some, something I never would have ex experienced or experienced something unique and awesome, so why not? And so it was an amazing journey. Um, I was a very analytical person, very introverted, pretty antisocial, had no public speaking skills, um, really didn't know much about current events, public affairs, didn't know how to carry on conversations like that in any meaningful way. Uh, and I, I put these pictures up because in life, you know, you, you watch a transition and you go through transitions and you have to start somewhere and typically you start in a place where you're uncomfortable and it, it doesn't feel right. But through self-improvement, you can, you can go and make a difference. So in my first year, showed up, didn't know what I was doing, ended up signing up for Toastmasters, learning how to become a better public speaker, um, you know, getting into shape, hiring a trainer, reading the newspaper, watching the news, started to soften up those edges. In year two, things got a little better, found some amazing mentors who, who really helped me and encouraged me. And then ultimately in year three, amazingly enough, I ended up uh, winning and uh, going to Miss America. And I tell this story not for that reason, but because what ended up happening was that little nonprofit that I started as my platform issue ended up turning into a national nonprofit. And it's called Science from Scientists now. And we send scientists into schools every other week to teach curriculum relevant material, to inspire kids and teachers. We have professional development programs that we run for teachers and outreach programs. Right now we serve around 9,300 kids in grades three through eight uh, across 77 schools in multiple states. We improve standardized test scores significantly for students. And we even had a stage show at Disney World. And so again, this never would have happened had I not taken the opportunity to do something unique and different. This experience also led to something else, which is now what I'm focusing a lot of my time on. I was doing an appearance as Miss Massachusetts at a VA hospital in Massachusetts, and someone said to me, what are you going to do with your life? This is a question that every five years I think someone has, you know, asks. And at the time, I didn't know. It was unclear. And they said, well, there's someone you need to meet. He's a really neat guy, a really cool scientist. And so I met him, uh, ended up doing my PhD thesis work with him at Boston University School of Medicine. And during that six years, we discovered that with a very small volume of blood, you could actually look at the health of someone's gut microbiome. So that's all the little critters that live in your stomach and your intestines. And from that, you could, you could prescribe or suggest nutrition and lifestyle modifications to make that person be healthier. And you can make those personalized. And so one day towards the end of my PhD, I came home and my, my husband said to me, well, you know, why don't you just turn your PhD thesis into a company? And I sat down with Wayne and you know, we realized rather than publish papers uh, that would likely never be read by the majority of the population, we were passionate about personalized health care and helping people live healthier and better lives. And so we started a company, and it's called Excella. So like I mentioned, it, we have a pinprick test that looks at the health of your gut microbiome with personalized nutrition and fitness, lifestyle, and supplement interventions. And we believe in this concept of wellness from the inside out. So you can be healthy on the outside, but if you're really not healthy on the inside, then you're not truly healthy. And so that brings us to robots. So like I said earlier, my husband and I love to scuba dive. Uh, we were actually in Bermuda on a trip and diving with some wonderful friends, uh, one of whom is the curator of Rex. It's an amazing job to actually have. Think about it, you go diving every day as your job. And we were out on a boat with, with some friends and we jumped in the water and sure enough, we saw this, this critter, this creature, this fish. And I remembered having seen these things in a very different environment when we were diving in Indonesia. So this is called the lionfish. And apparently, as, as lore goes, uh, somebody in Florida in the 1980s had an aquarium fish tank that they dumped out into the Atlantic Ocean. And for the last 30 years, these lionfish have been replicating uh, 
uh, and are now a very problematic invasive species. Some issues with them. They mature very quickly in 12 months. They give off 30,000 eggs every couple of days. They are voracious eaters. They consume juvenile reef fish so they can eat 20 fish in 30 minutes or less. And they just keep eating. So if you're a horror movie fan, imagine this. And if you, you, can, you can Google this and see it, actually. When, you know, when they, when, sometimes when you pull out these fish and you cut them open, you just see dozens of baby fish inside of them. If you open their mouths, you can actually see the fish literally sticking out of their throats. So they are quite disgusting, uh, but they eat and they eat and they eat. And so, as you can imagine, they decimate coral reefs. 80% decrease of biomass in a month. Like I said, they're an apex predator. They have, very conveniently for themselves, they have 18 venomous spines on both sides of the body, so they're not particularly appealing from the perspective of, of someone trying to, uh, a fish trying to consume them. And most problematically, their breeding grounds are at depth, so recreational divers can't reach these depths. You need a different solution. And so over sushi and beers, our friends said to us on the boat, why don't you just build a robot to get the lionfish? And you know, I think my husband and I are, are, are builders, entrepreneurs. We, we love starting new things. We're also a little bit masochistic. And so we said, you know, why not? This is a really cool challenge. Why don't we start a, a nonprofit, start a business that uses robotics technology in order to solve and address actual environmental problems? And so we did. So the name of the company is Robots in Service of the Environment. And the theory behind this is that using a toolkit of low-cost robotics, we want to be able to address environmental problems. Scalability is critical, so just having one you know, million dollar robot to solve a problem just doesn't work, it is not particularly of interest. And so we, we dubbed this our lionfish Roomba of the sea because it, as you will see, actually sucks the lionfish up into the body of the robot. And it's actually been a remarkable project. Hundreds of volunteers have helped with this project, donating tens of thousands of volunteer hours. And we have engineers, we have programmers, we have designers and artists uh, media people who, who are involved and are always looking for other folks who are passionate about this. Um, we'll talk about that a little later, but we do have the, the booth downstairs in the tech showcase if you're interested in learning more or getting involved. So here is our robot. Uh, it's called the Guardian. You guys finally get a proper introduction. So using low-cost robotics tech found in the Roomba, we were able to create this robot. We're very proud of our robot. Um, it is a remotely operated vehicle, an underwater one, with a very unique capture mechanism. I'll show you a video and, and describe that to you. It is deployable from the surface and can reach depths. Now our new model actually can go to 1,000 feet, but, but quite deep. And it's, it's rather video game-like, so if you're a video game enthusiast like we are, you can control it from the surface with a sort of a PS4-style controller and fly it through the water. And so the premise here is, like I said, there's a controller that's attached, so if you're at the surface, you can fly the robot. There's a camera at the very front, as you can see, that allows you to navigate and pilot said robot. New, actually new models of the robot uh, even identify lionfish specifically to make it even easier to, to catch. There are paddles that are projecting from the robot. Um, at the very edge of those paddles, you have metal pieces that generate an electric field that actually stun the lionfish and then uh, suck it with a sucking mechanism into the tube. Around 10 to 20 lionfish can fit in at any given time. And one of the questions that we get quite often is, well, you know, you could probably go and catch other fish as well. The answer is no. Um, because lionfish have natural no natural predators in the Atlantic, there's nothing out there trying to find them. They typically are floating out, uh, just out in the open. But normal fish, if you approach them with this type of robot, will in fact swim away. So you don't have a problem of, of bycatch. 
Like I mentioned before, um, in many places in the Caribbean, also in Florida, recreational divers or sp with, with, with spears are able to uh, pick them off on the reefs. But the problem, of course, is that they breed at depth. And so our guardian is able to, to go to those depths in order to, to capture them. There's some great footage downstairs if you stop by our booth uh, of what, what you can find. You know, if you're a diver and you've been on the reef, here and there you'll see the lionfish. But if you go at depth where the breeding grounds are, there are literally football fields that are covered with lionfish. It's, it's a little horrifying. So here's just a video of what this looks like. This was actually our first capture. So as you can see, the robot is approaching the fish. You can see it stun the fish and then suck the fish into the tube. Voila. And so one of the questions that we asked ourselves, which is extremely important, is how does, this, how does this scale? How can this robot really make a difference when lionfish are everywhere? So there's, they've been found as far north as Boston to Brazil. I mean, they're everywhere. And so how, how does this actually work? And you know, we, of course, are, are very mission-oriented. We, we care about the project and the, the premise. But is that enough? And you know, to us, I think the answer is, is no. In order to do this properly, there needs to be a scalable model. Uh, like I mentioned, if this is something where it's a million dollar robot and there's one, it's just not gonna solve the problem. And so we were thinking about how do you incentivize people to, to use the robot and to either have a viable business or something that they can do that would benefit them. Uh, and how do you keep the cost, because cost matters, low enough that a, a commercial fisherman could use this product? And the good news is, you can eat them. They're sort of a white, flaky fish. Um, they're quite tasty. If, if you've ever, if you've ever um, been down the Caribbean or in, in Florida, they, they serve these things. Celebrity chefs are, are creating really cool meals and things. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's a great way to, to deal with the issue of you know, sustainable fishing, because they're there. And we don't want them to be there. So we decided, yeah, in thinking this through, is that you could, in fact, build a viable business. So if the, the cost of the robot is around $1,000 right now, the, the goal is to decrease that over time. But let's say that on a given day, you could catch between 100 and 200 fish. They weigh about a pound and change. They're about $8. Uh, the, the price is around $8 per pound. In a given day, you could make around $2,000 doing this. And so from the perspective of a commercial fisherman, this actually makes a lot of sense and is even comparable to what tuna fishermen make. And of course, you know, there's a lot of issues with, with the way that tuna is, is caught. So this is, in fact, a viable business. And so we, we coined this term, eat em to beat em, uh, because this is a great way to, to solve this problem. And so this is actually a video from uh, an event that happened a couple of years ago in Bermuda. Celebrity chefs from around the world were invited to share their lionfish recipes and more and more there are lionfish derbies happening. You, you, you find celebrity chefs in Florida and the Caribbean who are opening restaurants, really serving, you know, serving lionfish. And uh, it was a, a neat contest, everything from lionfish ceviche to soups to purees to, to fried lionfish. Uh, but it was, it was quite you know, amazing to see just how this was something that was happening more and more. We've started having some conversations with Whole Foods. Um, they are, they have agreed and they're willing to actually um, sell lionfish. The issue is just volume. And so again, as this scales up and more uh, fishermen have this tool in their hands, the goal is to be able to sell, uh, sell the fish this way. And that's very exciting for us. And then, of course, there's education. And this is something that is very near and dear to, to my heart. Um, you know, if you can teach a child uh, about the significance of invasive species, preservation, conservation, marine science, they ultimately go home and they tell their parents, their friends, their, their cousins about the problem. And frankly, 
they're the ones that are going to have to deal with this in the future. So very important to spend the time to, to educate the public and you know, what better way than by going into schools, providing lesson content that, that can be taught. Uh, we do vacation program design that are week-long programs and even theater style events where we go in and do demonstrations to try to inspire kids and, and get them really fired up about robotics, marine science, uh, invasive species, et cetera. And, and thankfully, kids and, and adults all love robots um, and marine stuff, so it doesn't, it's not that hard to really inspire them that way. And so we, we reach the end. Um, you know, I hope that this has provided you with a little bit of uh, motivation to try something new. And if someone says, hey, why don't, why don't you try this or that or the other thing that you keep an open mind and think about whether or not that could be useful for your career and personal development. So you know, why don't you just give it a go? And if you guys are interested, um, please come to the Tech Showcase. We have, we have a booth with information. If you're interested in volunteering, we'd love to have you. Uh, and thank you so much. I can take questions if there are any.